Okay, so welcome, welcome to how to retain and recruit diverse talent. Uh, it's really great to see you here today. Um, I wanna say a huge thank you on behalf of my social enterprise, Rocking Your Teens. Your donations will go towards increasing resilience, inspiring and raising aspirations in teenagers. And if anyone wants to find out more about Rocking Your Teens, please go to rockingyourteens.com. We actually have an event coming up for International Men's Day, a boys conference. So if you know some young men in their teenage years, you might want to direct them to our event but it's really kind of you to donate um, uh, to this worthy cause. So who am I? Well, my name is Jenny Garrett. I'm an award-winning career coach, author, and leadership trainer. My books explore the empowerment of working women and women in leadership roles. And together with my team, we use our years of experience in coaching and leadership to support women and ethnically diverse leaders to progress in the workplace as well as supporting majority group leaders in making inclusion happen. So why does diverse talent matter? Because that's what we're talking about. Um, you know, when it works well, gosh, it's a wonderful environment where you feel that you belong, um, everyone gets on and is able to make a difference, be productive and creative and work with those tensions that come from difference. When it doesn't work well, gosh, um, people feel excluded. They feel um, that they can't progress within an organization. There are tensions that are insurmountable and typically organizations are not doing so well. Um, you know, according to research by McKinsey, companies without diverse talent are likely to be less competitive and actually lag behind in financial performance. Recruitment and retention are central to ensuring that companies attract the very best diverse talent. So I don't know if you knew, the underemployment rate for the ethnically diverse population is still higher than for white workers. So the underemployment rate for ethnically diverse workers is 15.3. For white workers, it's 11.5 in the UK. And that's according to the McGregor Smith Review. Uh, in addition, all ethnically diverse groups are more likely to be overqualified than white ethnic groups, uh, but white employees are more likely to be promoted than all groups. So think about that. You might have all of the degrees, all of the qualifications, but yet you find other people uh, being promoted above you. And that research is according uh, is from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Um, and also the employment rate for ethnic minorities in the UK is 62.8% is compared to the employment rate for white workers of 75.6%. So we know the talents there um, uh, because ethnically diverse people are underemployed and overqualified and ready for you to give them opportunities. Um, but there's a lot of work to do. Um, and when we're talking about diverse talent today, we're talking really about those who have, are visibly um, ethnically diverse and their heritage is visibly ethnically diverse. So in this panel discussion and Q&A, top executive coaches who you can see here is Shireen Bradley, Sadia Salam and Yvonne Akin Moden are listed in the diverse executive coach directory um, and they're going to discuss why diverse talent matters and what it looks like, how to assess your readiness for a truly diverse workforce and frameworks and support that you need to put in place to enable a diverse workforce to thrive. Now, the diverse coach directory brings together coaches from uh, all different backgrounds who are really well qualified, uh, top quality, um, the top of their field, um, and we bring them together to showcase them. Because in the field of executive coaching, it's often assumed there is no one from diverse background within it. Um, and it's really important to showcase the people who are here and doing amazing work. In addition, if your coaching pool is all uh, you know, white females, which it often is, 
then what are you missing? It's a question to be asking in your organizations. And if your senior team is all white men or white women, how can you get that diversity of thought um, into the picture? A diverse coach could possibly help you. So I really encourage you to look at the directory and my wonderful colleague, Sneta, um, will be adding various links into the chat. Do look out for them and save them so that you can come to um, them later. So how we're going to run the session is that Ishreen, Sadia and Yvonne will briefly introduce themselves. Um, I will start off by asking them some questions and then we're going to open it up to you. Uh, so for your questions and reflections, so do type in the chat. Sneta, my colleague, will be looking out for your questions and she'll be flagging them up to me. And we really love your questions and your insights. So do feel free to share them um, and, and we'll go to them and share them after I've asked the questions that I um, want to ask first of all. For those of you who love a bit of social media, um, the hashtag for the event is Diverse Talent. And uh, all of our handles for Twitter will be added into the chat but it's at Jennifer Garrett, at Ishreen Bradley, at Sadia Salam Coaching, and at My Career Matters. Uh, and also uh, for the directory, it's at BAME Exec. And you can find us all on LinkedIn also. Um, Sleta will be frantically typing away and adding all of this into the chat for you. So don't worry if you didn't catch what I just said. We like to start with a poll to understand where you're at and what your perspectives and reflections are. Um, so I'm going to uh, start the poll. Um, uh, let's see if it's going to let me. I did have a problem with the poll last time as well. Sometimes the polls don't want to work. Let's give it another go. I might just have to ask you the question if it doesn't let me open it. Let's give it one last try. You can see the poll. But let's, aha, launch, there we are. Okay, so the question is, my biggest challenge when it comes to recruiting and retaining diverse talent is, you can't find the talent, diverse talent is not attracted to my organization, Diverse talent doesn't fare well within our recruitment process. Uh, diverse talent leaves quickly or something else. And if there's something else, please do feel free to type in the chat. So at the moment, there are over 70 of you here. I'll see if I can get three quarters of you uh, completing the chat or 80% maybe, and then I'll close it down. Okay, a few more. If you can't see the poll for some reason, I know sometimes if you're joining from a phone or an iPad, it can be challenging. Feel free just to type in the chat and let us know what you would answer. Any more? Okay, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Okay. So hopefully you can see that diverse talent is not attracted to my company is the top uh, next followed by can't find talent um, and then uh, diverse talent doesn't fare well within our recruitment process um, diverse talent leaves quickly and uh, other two percent so really interesting diverse talent isn't attracted to your company uh, and that's uh, you know really interesting to consider what what is that um, yeah, and we're going to talk about what some of those reasons might be as we go through today's session. But great to know what the challenges are. Um, and thank you so much for completing, uh, for completing the poll. It's always interesting for us to know what they are. So let's go on to getting our wonderful panel of amazing coaches to introduce themselves. And we'll start with Ishreen. Please introduce yourself. Hello everyone, hello, thank you for joining us. So good to be with you. My name's Ishreen, Ishreen Bradley, and my passion is that everyone gets a fair crack at work. I'm the Chief Inspir Inspiration Officer and founder at Belonging Pioneers, and that's where we help leaders to realize their ambitions for their organization around equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And we do that through 
um, working on the culture of the organization and creating environments where people can thrive and also developing diverse leaders. Um, I take a holistic approach to that. We look not just at the intellect, the mind, but also the heart and the instinct and really engage people in the process. Um, I've won many awards for my work with underrepresented groups. And as I said, I'm really passionate in supporting everybody to have a fair opportunity. And that comes from who I am and my felt experience as well. You know, being um, Asian, being brown, being a single mother, divorcee, um, and an engineer. So that's me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ishreen. I'm going to go to Sadia next. Oh, good morning. I love that, Ishreen. Um, so yes, I'm Sadia Salam. I'm a coach, uh, an inclusion facilitator and a recovering lawyer. So I started life as a corporate lawyer and I did. I had 10 great years in a law firm, private practice, and then I went in-house for as a head of legal for another 10 years. And I reached the stage in my wonderful career where I had done everything I'd wanted to do in my career, but I really wanted to help others with theirs. And that's when I turned to coaching and started coaching whilst I was head of legal and then set up my business a few years ago. And now I get to spend all my time working with amazing senior women who often look amazing on paper, but don't necessarily feel it for lots of reasons. And that sometimes because they're in a crossroads in their career, sometimes they just feel stuck and feel that there's something wrong with them when actually it just means they want to grow. So I get to work with them those amazing women now as their coach. And I also work with um, organizations to help them have those courageous conversations that they probably don't want to have, but need to have to create that inclusive culture, which I know we're gonna talk about today, but for me, that, that's the key to attracting and retaining diverse talent. Um, and that's me. Wonderful, thank you, Sadia. And last, but definitely not least, Yvonne. Good morning, everyone. I'm Yvonne Akimoten, and um, I am an executive um, career coach. Um, I think similar to Sadia, my, my background and my journey started in a completely different sector. Um, I, I, my background is HR, human resources, and I did that for um, over 20 years. And in that, in that um, profession, like most of us, you get to a point where you take a step back and think, is this really the path for me? Um, am I really achieving the kind of things that are fulfilling? And I got to a point where I just felt um, a lot of what I was doing was delivering um, negative and not necessarily good news to people. Um, and I wanted to do something that was really going to make a difference. And so a few years ago, I transitioned into career coaching. And a big part of what I do is help other people who feel stuck and who are looking to transition themselves. Um, a lot of the clients that I work with um, are, are women. Um, many are women of color, although not exclusively, but many are women of color. And one of the things that they all have in common is breaking through that glass ceiling, making the next step to the next part of their career journey. And how do they do that? That, um, and while still maintaining their um, their own identity, and that's a big challenge that a lot of the women I work with face. So that's definitely something that I work um, a lot with. And um, so that's that's me. Wonderful, thank you. As you can see, our coaches are high caliber and bring with them such a wealth of experience. Um, a real wonderful addition to any uh, coaching pool uh, that you might have in your organization, or maybe you're thinking about some one-to-one -one coaching for yourself. Um, we really do encourage you to go to the directory and get in touch with them. So let's get to it. Let's start, um, dig into these questions. So my first question to you is why does diversity diverse talent matter? And what's the best way to recruit diverse talent? Um, it was one of the challenges that came up. It wasn't the top issue um, that uh, came up in, in, on the poll, but recruiting diverse talent is a challenge. Um, and so I'm going to ask Yvonne first, why does diverse talent matter? And how best to recruit diverse talent? So um, diverse talent matters because we are a, a diverse country. We have people with a range of skills and abilities from all 
um, ethnic backgrounds um, imaginable, um, ethnic and, and also gender backgrounds. And the wider organizations can, um, the organizations can, can tap into that wider array of skills and abilities are more likely to be more productive. And research tells us that the more diverse you are as an organization, the more productive you are as an organization. And really what you want to do is once you start to attract um, people from those diverse backgrounds, you will continue to be more diverse. Um, so diversity breeds diversity. So it's an important thing for organizations to recognize that they are harnessing the wider um, community in which many organizations serve. Um, I think the other thing to quickly add to that um, is that um, within, as, as my background, as I've mentioned, is, is HR, and a lot of organizations will have recruitment budgets, and a lot of what they um, really want to think about is how they can use those budgets to best effect, so that they are really reaching out to the wider communities and the wider audience that they may be able to tap into as part of their um, retention or recruitment strategy really good point isn't it this idea about supplier diversity making sure you have the bu budgets for um finding the right suppliers where you can advertise and reach that talent um and i'm sure there are some human resources people here who that will really strike a chord with the cipd have a supplier diversity guide um and we'll try and get the link for you because i think that will be really helpful for those for those who are listening who find that useful so sadia same question to you what does diverse, why does diverse talent matter and how best to recruit? Sure. So for me, I always go to the human element um, of this because I know you've, you've talked about in research how it's more productive. There's more innovation when you've got diversity. There's loads of um, research around that. But I, I always loved the amazing Claudia Crawley, who I think is on today. She mentioned in another panel event how organisations are a micro organisation of the world which I think sums it up. So you can live your life and then suddenly enter the office and it's a completely different world. And I remember when I, I worked with a lot of lawyers and new lawyers, and especially lawyers and law students who've grown up in London, um, gone to school in London, gone to law school, university in London, they've never felt like a minority because they haven't been in that environment. And they set foot into a law firm and suddenly they're a minority for the first time at the age of 23 and it really hits them and you don't really understand why but it does hit you You're like what wow what's going on and talent nowadays wants to be in a diverse workforce they will notice it they walk from a diverse world into an organization that is so different you immediately get feelings of not fitting in not belonging can i say what i really think you immediately start to fit in and then you don't get the best out of your talent if talent is trying to fit in rather than be themselves you you, you don't get their magic. And you're only going to get their magic if that diverse talent sees or knows that you're building a diverse organisation. And it was interesting that what came up was that, you know, diverse talent are not really attracted to us in the poll. They will, if you're honest, if they can see that you're working on diversity, they will be attracted to you. Because I know when I was going for jobs and when the young talent goes for jobs, they're looking at the job, you know, what's the role? And then they'll look at the diversity of the organization. And they need to know that you want it to be diverse. So diversity absolutely matters. And then on the recruitment, how do you recruit? I think you start at the basics, look at your ads, look at your recruitment agents. Are they diverse? Are you using inclusive wording? And I've been to a lot of recruitment agents. You know, if they're not diverse, who are they working with that are diverse? Because it's going to be the diverse recruitment agents that actually go out to the diverse cohorts, they know where to go, diversity will come to them as well. You need to look at all of that and keep looking at it, keep auditing it, what's working, and keep changing it if it's not. But there's lots of people out there and come to us if you want referrals as to you know, who to speak to in the recruiting world, we'll happily tell you, we'll happily look at your ads. You know, that's a two minute job to look at your ad to see whether it's inclusive or not. Happy to help there. Yeah, completely agree. I'm finding more people coming to me and asking me, you know, do you know someone who, and I'm really happy to try and try and help. It does take extra effort, doesn't it, to try and find someone who's maybe not in your usual network, but it's really not impossible. And I, and I think that's, you know, a really strong message. Thank you, Sadia. And Ishreen, what are your thoughts on why diverse talent matters and how best to recruit? Yeah, so 
I told you I come at it from a holistic angle, right? So my, my gut tells me, my instinct tells me it's just the right thing to do. My heart tells me it's not fair that people don't have that opportunity of success. But the thing is, those things don't sell in an organization. They don't engage people. So you need facts. And Jenny gave you some really good facts. My favorite source um, of a case for action around this comes from Harvard Business School. And, um, you know, one of the many diverse practical sources of evidence. And they have identified eight critical capabilities for success in a complex world. So this is what they say the leaders of an organization need to have in order to succeed. Um, and honestly, I don't think the world's ever been as complex as it is now. So it's a great time to make this case. Um, and within these eight capabilities, Harvard identified 24 leadership skills of which at least nine require diverse talent. So nine out of 24, that's quite a significant amount, right? Um, so some examples of those capacities, and these are um, quoted in kind of leadership skills um, language, uh, builds diverse teams to solve problems, crafts a global strategy that also incorporates region specific tactics, navigates culturally complex, often nuanced business situations, shapes work assignments to meet different needs and values, fosters an inclusive work environment. So if those are the skills that are required of your leaders to succeed in this complex world, then you're gonna need diverse talent to accomplish that. And um, it kind of leads to, my, the only thing I have to add to what Sadia and Yvonne have already said about how to attract diverse talent, um, you know, many, it's train your hiring managers, anybody who hires, train them. And, uh, you know, I've worked with organizations where for a middle management role, they're advertising the requirement for a Cambridge University degree. And it's like, you really don't need that. You know, start, you really don't need that. Start looking at what are the minimum skills rather than the maximum skills. Yeah, such a good point there. I think talent, uh, you know, if you've got this cookie cutter idea of what talent looks like, you need to turn that on its head and think about what is it I really need? What's teachable um, and, and what's at the core of the sort of person I need? Um, and also, uh, yeah, someone might have a different accent than you. They might go, you know, have a different way of um, communicating than you. But how, what's the good thing about that? How can I appreciate that? rather than seeing something that's different and thinking it's not as good. Um, yeah, it's about challenging your thinking around that. So really good points. If you've got a link to that Harvard Business article, um, I'm sure the audience would love it in the chat, um, if that's possible, Shreen. Oh yeah, immediately someone, Franz asked exactly that question. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> I know our audience really well. They love, they love to find out where the research is. Okay, so let's quickly move on to the next question. So how can you tell if your company or your team is truly ready for a diverse workforce. And I'm going to start with Sadia on this one. Thank you. So, so for me, if I'm asking myself, I'm looking at a company and I'm saying, gosh, are they ready for a diverse workforce? My answer will be no, because I shouldn't be having to do the digging. If a company it wants a diverse workforce, you should be out there saying it. It's not a secret. If you keep it as a secret, it makes me think, actually, you don't want me and you don't want others like me. You just want others that are the same as you. And I speak to lots of companies and they're like, well, I, we're not doing it as much as our competitor. And we did this event and some people liked it, some people didn't like it. And so whenever there's anything like that, people, organizations withdraw and they think, well, I'm just not gonna say anything. You know, we're good at what we do. We're just gonna stick with that because you know we're up there on that, but we're, on, we're up here on diversity. So therefore we're just not gonna talk about diversity that's not the way to do it because you will lose diverse talent they just won't go to you it's better to say it's better to talk about what you're doing if you've got an employee resource group um whether it's gender whether it's race talk about them talk about what they're doing talk about how your people meet on a human level that's what diversity is about it's everything on a human level and i'm sure your organizations are doing that so talk about it um it means a lot and it doesn't mean you're perfect by any means, if it means you're setting up employee resource groups, great, 
ask for recommendations. Say we're talking with our competitors to find out what's working for them on these things. Be honest about what you're doing, but you have to speak. You can't be silent on this. But yeah, I love it. Hard hitting, Sadia. You've got a strong position there. And I, I really, I really enjoy that listening to that. Thank you. I'll go to Ashree next. Yeah, so so I think what it is is a lot of organizations call themselves a meritocracy and they pride themselves on being a meritocracy. And that's great, right? But the problem with it being a meritocracy is that you fail to understand that not everybody's had the same benefits, not everybody's at the same point on the starting line. So I would say an organization uh, that looks like it's working on this would um, have the philosophy of we're about equity of opportunity rather than being a meritocracy. Um, and so really looking at what do different groups, different individuals need in order to be successful. Um, and you'd be an organization that's working towards uh, an equitable working environment. And Sadi has said, it, you know, be proud about what you've done, be honest about what you haven't done and find a way for everybody to be engaged in the process. So everybody has a clear what's in it for me. Um, not in the sense of, you know, I'm going to write like there's an organization that um, I've heard about that's saying, you know, every individual has to have a diversity objective. In their in their career development plan and kind of like, but that's not winning their heart right they'll do it because they're told to so you need to find a way of engaging them in which they see value for themselves um, and then the final point i want to make around this is that leaders from underrepresented groups need to experience an equitable work environment so um, they feel confident, they're in action, they're applying for opportunities to progress and they, they speak up and they feel safe to speak up. And, and if I'm coming to interview with your organization and I can see that, you know, we, uh, you know that whole saying about what communicates most is body language, right? So if I'm walking around the office on my way to the interview room and I see that everybody's feeling confident not like a certain category speaking up and the other other the underrepresented groups are, are kind of hiding away in a corner then I'm gonna know I'm not gonna enjoy it here right so you want to you want to make sure your people are happy yeah absolutely I think it's really interesting the this idea about um equity and I think a lot of people find it really hard to grasp Bishreen this idea that uh, as a line manager I should be treating everyone the same well no because everyone's coming from different places needing different things and I always think about it like a little bit like children really you some children want to want lots of your attention some children want to be left alone some want to do sports with you some want to sit and watch tv you know and uh, you know and it's about thinking what do what do they need to be able to thrive and be at their best and it won't be the same thing so um yeah and i think but i know that's challenging because no one wants to be looking at like it's favoritism um you know something that really resonates is for everyone to win no one has to lose yeah, no one has to lose out in this. Everyone can win and there is no loss if we have a more inclusive environment, we have more diversity. There's no loss, there's only winning. Yvonne, coming to you, what's, what's your perspective? So um, like most things, and we hear this all the time, everything has to start from the top. So it's all about what are your leaders willing to do? Many organizations, especially in the last um, 18 months or so, have got um, diversity champions, inclusion champions, whatever title you're giving to people in the organization. And that's all well and good. But if an organization is truly ready to implement a diverse workforce, that change has to start from the top and it has to happen at board level. It has to be owned at board level. So the kinds of things that organizations need to be looking at is um, within our organization, what can we do differently? What are we doing now? Um, and if it's not making a difference and we are truly committed to this, what can we do? Um, and some of that will mean partnering with other 
types of organizations. Um, maybe you don't want to partner necessarily with your competitors, but there are organizations out there. There are recruitment organizations that specialize in identifying diverse talent. Um, maybe it's partnering with them. Maybe it's partnering with universities. It, a whole, there's a whole raft of partnerships that could be developed. And that strategy should sit within the business plan because that's where everything comes forward. So if I'm looking at a diverse workforce, I'm looking at the very top, I'm looking at the business plan and I need to be seeing that woven into the fabric of what the organization is doing rather than it sitting within just the diversity and inclusion um, area. They are there to facilitate, but they are not necessarily there to drive the strategy. That has to come from the top. So for me, I think if you get, you're getting that, that's where you're going to really know you are taking action that is going to be supported because the people at the top are the ones driving the change. Thank you so much. Absolutely uh, agree with you. And you're getting others as well um, in the chat, you know, really resonating and taking that approach, that executive team approach and cascading it down. So um, some amazing points, really useful points. Um, one point that someone's made is that sometimes there's this disconnect. There's the sort of, yes, these are our targets. This is what we really strive for, but it's not um, connected with action. And it's having that strategy, but it's also having the tactics and the heart as well as Ishreen was talking about to really want to do it. Sometimes I personally think what gets measured gets done and although it should be that we want to do it because it's the right thing to do, sometimes we do need it to be in our objectives to actually focus on it because of the time pressures of work and how easy it is to let things slip but I completely uh, do resonate with it should be from our heart as well. So final question from me before we go to the audience and there's some really fantastic um, questions coming through from the audience. So what frameworks and support do you need to put in place to enable a diverse workforce to thrive? Um, and I'm gonna start with Ishreen on this one. So what frameworks and support do you need to put in place to enable a diverse workforce to thrive, Ishreen? So it starts with knowing where you're at, doesn't it, really? So the first framework that you need to have in place is what I call your as-is assessment. Um, and, you know, there are many benchmarking tools. Um, we have one that we use, but the, the areas you want to be looking at is where are we around our governance and leadership when it comes to equity, diversity, inclusion and belonging, where are we with our talent life cycles? So that whole thing from recruitment, retention, training, development, progression. Uh, one area that I find our clients often don't think about is communications. So internal communications to the staff to engage them, to get colleagues really motivated around this and see why they're doing it and to keep up to speed with it and also external communications. Um, so what are we telling our external stakeholders about this and how are we engaging them and really demonstrating our commitment, as Sadia said in, in the last question, right? Um, you want to be looking at where you're at with your customers and your offers. Are your offers appealing to diverse um, audiences and, and buyers? And, and you want to look at how you're monitoring and measuring all of that. So the first framework is a, a kind of way of benchmarking that, that looks at where you're at. Um, the other thing that we're finding a lot uh, in working with clients in this area is that question of privilege. And when I say privilege, I'm not talking about white privilege, okay, which is really horrible and, and is, is getting a lot of um, negative uh, backlash around this whole area. I'm talking about every human being has some form of privilege. So you want to look at where is privilege around education, privilege around, um, you know, they call it beauty bias, don't they? Privilege around things like height and color and, and um, you know, even body shape. Privilege around um, the networks that people have access to. Where is all of that impacting the opportunity for people to progress? We call this the privilege conundrum now, and we're doing some research in the area because we're getting really curious about you know, a lot of a lot of frameworks around equity, diversity, inclusion and belonging exist and they've been tried and they've been used. But actually, what's at the source? And we're, we're just exploring to see 
you know, where do different kinds of privilege come into it? And the other um, support is really, I think, around enabling everybody to be heard and feeling psychologically safe in the organization. So those would be the three frameworks I would recommend. Wow, thank you so much. Yeah, so much there to unpack. Really, really helpful. I'll go to you, Yvonne, next. So I, I think a big part of the framework has to sit within um, the kind of culture that the organisation is trying to promote. So what kind of organisation do we want to be? And I think that, that, that question opens the door to people being able to really comment. Um, an organisation that is truly inclusive has to be inclusive, not just um, through word, but through deed. And the best way to do that is to make sure that you are asking the, the questions. You, you have a culture that enables people to ask and to challenge. Um, and, and obviously not challenging in an aggressive way, but being able to feel that it's, um, to, to borrow um, Ishan's words, to be a safe, a safe environment where people can, can openly challenge. And I think the, the best um, sort of um, example I can give of this is a few years ago, I was working in an organization and they were saying, we are really struggling to get um, diverse workforce into this organization. We're just not attracting. So they set up a fast track program that was aimed at, at really fast tracking minority groups. This all sounded great. And I, I led on, on this program. And when I started to do the framework around this program, one of the things that one of the directors said to me is, well, when we try and get people through this door, the important thing here is to just really go out and attract people that are from this diverse background and move them through the ranks. Um, we don't need to do any assessments. We don't need to do anything. We just want to move them through the rank because it's really important that we are showing that we're an inclusive organization. And I had to really battle with this because I was saying what people are looking for, you still need them to have the qualifications, you still need people and to have the, the experience and the tools to do the job. What we're not looking for is something that is patronizing or tokenistic. Um, and she, she really struggles with this. And this was a really this was a really big issue for us because I had to kind of re-educate her to say, actually, we still need people to have the skills, the tools, and the ability. We just want to open the door so that people can actually get a chance to present what they can do. Um, but we still need to have a process that goes that really enables that. So part of this um, whole approach of looking at having a diverse workforce and moving people through the organization has to take into consideration the fact that you still need to support those people. But what you need to start with is just having that open door to say, we are looking for people to come in. And the final point I would also say is a really is, is a thing that I see many organizations don't do is they don't actually ask the people who need the help, what can we do to help you? assumptions are made and put, tools are put in place that sound fantastic, but nobody's actually asked the people who are experiencing it whether this is the right tool for them. So I think if, you're, if you don't know, ask the question. Absolutely. Wonderful points. Lots of resonating with um, other, others who are here in the audience. And yeah, listening groups are a great starting point. Um, you know, that listening and understanding and then thinking about what you can do to support uh, your underrepresented groups in your organisation. Last but not least, Sadia, and then we'll go to the questions from the audience. Sure, just building on what Ishleen and Yvonne have said, I, I agree, I have four top tips. And number one is starting with the self, which Ishreen covered brilliantly. And then my second one is the onboarding process. I think it's the most crucial process with diverse talent. Where as soon as they walk through that door, they need to be introduced to the to the right people to the employee resource groups you know if you've got race groups gender groups they need to be introduced to them straight away don't wait for them to meet them themselves they do need mentor sponsoring and a coach you know a lot of the senior women i deal with they need a coach otherwise they're just taking what you know baggage from one organization to another but not talking about it and just getting on with the job without focusing on themselves so you need to help your talent um, and actually coaching, mentoring within organisations and sponsoring actually helps everyone because it connects people as well. So it's a really good thing, but it's crucial on the onboarding. And 
and introducing them to people. So the onboarding process is really crucial. Don't hide anything, you know, bombard them with love in the first few weeks. That, that's okay. Um, the third one for me is stretch projects. When we join organizations, we want good work, whatever our field, we, we join organizations because we want to grow. We want the good work. And I remember when I started as a corporate lawyer 22 years ago, um, I was noticing when I qualified that, that all, I was the only girl in my intake as newly qualified corporate lawyers, but I was noticing I wasn't getting any of the sexy deals. I just wasn't. And I couldn't understand why I wasn't getting any of the sexy deals. So I plucked up the courage to speak to a partner and say, well, um, I've noticed that I've been given all the research stuff, but actually I'd really like to work on I don't know, one of the big M&A deals. And he said, well, just ask. So that was a good tip. I started asking from that day forward and I got, whenever I asked, I got it. But what he didn't realize was I was thinking, but why am I asking? And nobody else seems to be asking, but they get the deals. And that stayed with me. And my final thing is a formal retention, retention plan. What I've seen in one organization, there was nothing to do with me. They already had it, it was amazing. They have stay interviews. So every six months, they have a stay interview. They talk about expressly what's working well, what isn't working well, and what can they do to get you to stay. And that should be for everyone. That doesn't necessarily need to be with diverse talent, which I thought was a brilliant idea. Amazing golden nuggets there. Really, really helpful. And what I love about it is it's all so practical. Thank you all so much. This uh, so much knowledge, which I think are really, really helpful um, for everyone. And I hope you've all been frantically taking uh, taking notes there. So going to some of the questions, uh, I'm going to put a couple together, which are about um, unconscious bias. So one question was, do you think we should be pushing more training and awareness around unconscious bias? And then another one is about the fact that they feel unconscious bias um, comes in at the interview and selection process um, with managers. And, and that could be a barrier to the success of um, be having a more diverse uh, workforce in the first place. So any thoughts on unconscious bias? Raise a hand if you want to take that question. Yeah, Shireen. So, we find that uh, yeah, many organizations roll out what, what's called unconscious bias training. And it's had, um, I think research has now proved that it has a negative impact in many cases, right? Is that people say things like, well, that's just my unconscious bias, deal with it, which isn't terribly helpful. Um, so we prefer um, approaches to training that are more about conscious inclusion. So how can you consciously include everybody? And if you're going to do training, I'd recommend take that angle. Uh, but training has its limitations, you know, in creating a new culture. It's, it's an essential component, but it's not the only component. You've got to look at the leadership and you've got to look at um, how everyone's connecting with each other. As Sadia said, you've got to look at who's getting the stretch projects as a it, it, it's a complex area. Training may be a place to start, but again, I wouldn't, I would look at conscious inclusion rather than unconscious bias if you're doing that. Fabulous, really, really great angle. And um, Fran loves that uh, point. Um, we uh, ran a session on allyship previously um, and about how you can actively um, uh, not be a bystander and how you can take action around the inclusion um, and I'd encourage you to go if you weren't on that session to go back to that session as well which I think very much aligns with um, what Ishreen is talking about there. So another question for you, um, uh, 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 how should organizations avoid recruiting diverse people who do not see gender and race inequality? Um, so we have, for example, the Tory party has a more diverse cabinet than ever, but the black and brown people support the view that institutional racism doesn't exist, despite the evidence. Um, and um, I'm going to say this is an opinion of someone. <laughs> I'm not saying that I, uh, yeah, that we are saying that, but just, you know, what do you think? The fact is that you can have um, on the face of it, a diverse workforce, but actually they're not necessarily so diverse, really. Uh, Sadia. I think it's a, a great question, and, and I think it's a great question because it, it, when we're when we are recruiting diverse talent, it, it's not a tick box. So just because they tick the box of race or gender, they're not necessarily the best person for the job. Um, then they're very different points. So 
I've interviewed people like that who maybe on paper tick all the boxes, but actually they're very much out for themselves. And doesn't doesn't matter what gender they are, what colour they are, or what university they went to, that person's not going to fit into a, a team that I want to build an inclusive culture within. So you just don't hire those people and they're going to have to learn would be my advice. And if they're in your organisation already and they're not inclusive, and that's the question, isn't it? Are they inclusive? And if they're not, they're in the same band as many others in that organisation, I suspect, that aren't inclusive and therefore need the training and the support as all the other people um, would be my advice. Yeah, it's a really challenging one, isn't it? Because I think that it's almost like I'm recruiting my own image as close as I possibly can, but there's a little bit of difference. So I can say I've done it. And, and it's about really challenging yourself, isn't it? And maybe having different voices in the room, um, uh, having something. There's a book called Inclusion Nudges, um, which I, I recommend. And it says um, one of the tips is having a pair of glasses in the room with you and sort of saying and, and having them to remind you, am I looking at this through my lenses or should I be looking at it through another lens and we need those nudges to take us out of our usual way of working um, and our usual way of just um, seeing the world and we all do it every single one of us we have our biases we have those pathways that are well trodden in our mind and this is the way to go and it's really uh, sort of shaking ourselves out of that hopefully there are other colleagues who can help you do that but if not it is about you finding a way to be able to do it and nudges um, might be the way uh, to, to do that. So let me just find, so great answer, thank you so much. So we've got here, it's frustrating that when some people hear equity, it's interpreted as recruiting less qualified individuals. What can coaches do to challenge and support leaders in facing their own bias, which in turn affects strategy and policy, et cetera? What brilliant questions we're getting today. Uh, Yvonne, thank you. Yeah, so um, this is something that I come across all the time. So I'm sort of reasonably familiar with this. So essentially, um, the, there is, you know, at the risk of using the word education over and over again, and um, there is something about um, sitting down with recruiting managers to get to really un get them to understand what it is that they're recruiting for and why why that role needs to have certain particular skill sets and um, i mean some of the things that managers are looking for are not realistic sometimes they will ask for degrees they will ask for master's degrees they will ask for so so that's on on one on the one hand on the other hand what sometimes managers believe is the answer to getting a more inclusive workforce is by almost dumbing down the role so essentially saying well actually we are make we'll we'll make assumptions that if we're trying to reach people from these particular backgrounds and um, they won't have this they won't have that so we'll try and recruit um people with with this these lesser skills and um it, the the education and the coaching that 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 individual needs which needs to come from working with people like us really is to help them understand that um People from diverse backgrounds are some of the most educated people you will find in this country. So you do not need to compensate for trying to get people through the door by dumbing down your role. Where they might lack is the, is the opportunity to have the experience of doing that particular role. And so what the organizations need to be looking at is how can we create those opportunities for those people to gain the sought after skills and knowledge and experience that they need to be able to be successful in that job. And whether that is by looking at opportunities for secondment, whether that is looking at opportunities for them to do work shadowing, there are a number of tools organizations can put in place that will help those people to upskill them because that's usually the only thing that's missing. Um, in terms of intellect and ability, it's all there. They just need that support to be able to make themselves equitable in terms of um, it, having the, the right tools, all the right tools to do the, to do the job. Yeah, and I think there's an element of sort of covering as well. So I, I think, you know, if you go to an environment, an organization where you feel that you have to assimilate, 
sometimes what you do is you hide some of the best skills and qualities you have and uh, inclusive organizations allow you to bring out everything you have which means that yeah i might not have been at a debating society at school um and i and i might not be as networked as someone else but actually this is what i do bring um, and it, it's not that um, people can't sell themselves. It's you need to create an environment where it's safe for me to be able to shine and tell you about all of the great things. If I meet you and you close me down, I won't tell you about all of my experience and my skills. You'll miss out on knowing about that. If you create the right environment for me to flourish, you'll find out everything I have to offer. So there's a real place for organizations to understand that. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Um, yeah, let's go for this last question. Um, how do we how do we as an organization avoid tokenism? So we recruit a set number of diverse colleagues and they become our token diverse colleagues. But I find that businesses just stop at that. How do we encourage our senior leadership teams to continue hiring diverse talent rather than making the original few feel like they were just a tick box? Yes, go on. Okay. Right, it has to be a short answer. A very yeah, quick I'd like to kick off, but please, ladies, please do feel to jump in. Um, one of the things that a lot of organisations do that I see is they have policies in place, but actually um, harm diversity. So, for example, um, a lot of organisations have employee referral schemes. Um, and what happens is that they use the referral scheme and it's, it's a way of getting around having to spend a huge amount of money on recruitment. I get that. But what tends to happen is that you, you use that scheme. And if I am a white middle class person, chances are most of the people I know are of my image. And so the people I'm going to refer to the organization are going to be similar. And therefore it perpetuates that cycle. So it's about talking to the people who are from a wider diverse background, maybe even people who are not necessarily from that background and encouraging them to look beyond their immediate circle to say, we are looking to be more diverse. Who do you know outside of your current? So it's really creating more of a stretch for people to actually make more of a concerted effort to reach a wider audience. So if you're going to have that employee um, referral scheme, you, you just change the rules a little bit to make it a little bit more inclusive in the way that you run it. Fabulous. I'm going to uh, just go to our last question because unfortunately we're running out of time. We're getting calls for a part two. Uh, we'll see. We always need a part two to our conversations. Um, so we always end on a coaching question. Um, and it's sort of what question, coaching question, do you think you could leave our audience with to help them think about the, you know, the challenges of recruiting and retaining their diverse talent? Um, so I'm going to start with you, Vivon. What question would you leave the audience with? What coaching question? So I, I think um, my coaching question would be, um, if you are doing certain things in the organisation and they're not working, what could you do differently? What could you change? Um, because without making a change, nothing will be different. Fabulous. Thank you. Sadia. Mine's, what are you telling yourself that's difficult? about recruiting and retaining diverse talent and what's possible. Wonderful, lovely. And Ishreen. So my question is what makes this important to you personally really? And what makes it important to your organization for now and in the future? Wonderful, thank you. Brilliant coaching questions. So thank you everyone for attending today. I hope it's giving you a huge amount of food for thought. The panel, I think, were amazing and gave you so many nuggets of wisdom. I want to say a huge thank you to Ishreen Bradley, Sadia Salam and Yvonne Akinmodun, who you can find more about in the Diverse Coaching Directory. As I've said, it's a directory which connects corporate organisations with coaches from ethnically diverse backgrounds and Sneta has added the link a few times I think and she'll add it one more time and she's also shared um, the um, the tags uh, the Twitter tags uh, for the panel members. Uh, I want to leave you with a quote if you haven't hired a team of people who are of color female and or from the LGBTQ plus community to actively turn over every stone to scope out every nook and cranny, to pop out of every bush, to find every qualified, underrepresented, 
person in this country, you're going to miss out on a lot of money when the rest of the investment world and the rest of the world gets it, yeah? And that's a quote from Arlen Hamilton. You need to search hard, a high and low for talent. And when you get that talent, you need to do everything you can to keep it. And if you don't, um, you'll be saying bye-bye to your organization, to your livelihood, to your um, future creativity and sustainability. This is key to your success. It's also absolutely the right thing to do. So do look at our coaching directory um, and do find out more about the coaches who have spoken today and the other coaches that we have who are all amazing. Um, and do get in touch with me if any of this conversation resonates, if you want any help, if you're thinking about supporting, like supporting your ethnically diverse colleagues um, in their career, if you're thinking about challenging the thinking of your majority group leaders, we are the people who can help you. Um, we have more events coming up. Hopefully you're already signed up to our Eventbrite channel. Um, we have a, a session about make, harnessing diverse talent coming up in the next month. So look out for that. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And you will get a copy of this recording. Thank you so much to our panel. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.